Okay, I think we shall start. Uh, so welcome everybody to session 4C. Uh, the first talk is by uh, is a, on adjacency labeling for planar graphs. Uh, and Pat Morin will uh, give the talk. Pat, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, this is about adjacency labeling for planar graphs. And this is joint work with my friends, uh, Vida, Louis, Cyril, Gwen, and Piotr. Um, so the, the precise definitions are a bit awkward, so uh, let's give it a try. Uh, we have a, a function A, a graph G, and a labeling L of a graph. Um, and the function A takes binary strings as inputs. Uh, the labeling of the graph is with the, the vertices are, are labeled with binary strings. Um, and we say that this labeling uh, works with A if um, you take any two vertices in the graph which are adjacent, you use their, uh, their labels as inputs to A, and the output is one. And you take any two vertices in the graph that are not adjacent, use their inputs, uh, use their labels as inputs to A, and the output is zero. So we call A an adjacency tester uh, in this case. Um, and we're interested in, in whole graph families and we're interested in short labels. So a graph family has a, an f of n bit labeling scheme. If for every member of that family, every n vertex member of that family, you can label the vertices with f of n bits um, and such that that labeling works with a. And here a is one fixed function for the entire family. So you don't get to encode the graph inside of, uh, inside of A. The graph is uh, the only thing that changes with the, the graph are the, the labels. So for example, uh, A could be the function which outputs one if and only if the, the distance, the Hamming distance between its two inputs is one. Um, and if you use that adjacency uh, testing function, then you can see that hypercubes with the standard labeling of the, the hypercube um, uh, work with, uh, with A. So, uh, two vertices of the hypercube are adjacent if, if, and only if their, um, the distance between their, their labels is, uh, is one. And in terms of, uh, labeling schemes, this means that, uh, the family of hypercubes admits a log n bit labeling scheme. So there's a relationship between these labeling schemes and um, so-called universal graphs. And if a graph family has a, an f of n bit labeling scheme, that means there's a graph with two to the f of n vertices, um, such that every n vertex member of that graph family appears as an induced subgraph of this, uh, this, this graph. Um, so this thing is called a universal graph. And the proof is really easy. Uh, you just, uh, the vertices of this universal graph are the, the bit strings of length f of n, and uh, an edge is present in this universal graph if and only if the adjacency tester tells you that it should be present. Uh, and then just check the definitions and you'll realize that, uh, that this gives exactly what you, you, you want. Um, and uh, and these, this UN uh, is called the induced universal graph because every, uh, every graph in the family appears as an induced subgraph of, uh, of UN. Okay, so there are lots of previous results on labeling schemes. Uh, one of the simplest things to label are trees. And uh, going back uh, 30 years now, it's been known that there are labeling schemes for trees that use uh, log n bit labels. Uh, plus a lower order term. And uh, quite recently, the lower order term has even been reduced to a, a constant. Uh, next up from trees are bounded tree width graphs. So a little more complicated than trees. Uh, and again, uh, those can be labeled with log n bit labels plus a, a lower order uh, term. Uh, but what we're interested in this talk is planar graphs. And those have been studied uh, for quite a while. Um, and from the beginning, it was known that there were uh, some constant times log n bit labeling schemes for, for planar graphs. And that constant has been steadily going down uh, from six to four to three to two. Uh, so did last year, it was brought down to, to four thirds. And then finally today, what I'm gonna talk about 
is a uh, log n plus little o of log n bit uh, adjacency labeling scheme. And if you interpret that in terms of universal graphs, uh, that means that there's a graph un with a nearly linear number of vertices uh, that contains every n vertex planar graph as an induced uh, subgraph. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the proof of this. And to do that, I need to introduce uh, this notion of um, the graph product, in particular, the strong product, uh, which is pictured here. Um, so this picture shows the, the strong product of a tree, that's the thing on the left of the operator, and a path, a vertical path, that's the thing on the right. And in the product, what you find is uh, as many copies of the vertical path as there are vertices of the tree, and you also find as many copies of the tree as there are uh, vertices of the, the path. And in addition to that, you get these diagonal edges shown here as uh, red and blue edges, where you have a, a vertex, uh, an edge between two vertices, if the corresponding vertices are adjacent in the path and also adjacent in the, the tree. And so it's a little bit more than just the Cartesian product. And uh, all of this works because of a theorem uh, that appeared uh, at this conference last year uh, that's about planar graphs and the structure of planar graphs. And it says that uh, planar graphs are the strong product. So every planar graph uh, is the strong product of some graph H of a tree width at most eight and a path. So almost like in this picture, but instead of a, a tree on the left side of the operator, you have a graph of tree width at most eight. Um, and our main result is not really about planar graphs, it's about uh, these strong products and subgraphs of these strong products. Uh, and it just says that uh, if you have a family of all um, subgraphs of, of this kind of strong product, then you get a log n plus little o of log n bit labeling scheme. And the nice thing about that is um, that's not just planar graphs that have this property. So it includes bounded genus graphs, uh, apex minor free graphs, bounded degree graphs from minor closed families, uh, and k planar graphs for, for constant k. Okay, so um, I will very quickly uh, try and sketch the, some of the arguments that we, we use in this proof or some of the main ideas. Um, and probably the easiest thing to see is a, a warm-up exercise in which first we think only about induced subgraphs and instead of H times P, uh, we'll just look at P times P, so the strong product of two paths. Uh, that's really easy to understand. It's just this grid pictured here uh, with, uh, with diagonals across the, the square faces. And uh, in this graph, or in a subgraph of this graph, every vertex naturally has a, an x-coordinate uh, telling you which column it's in, and a y-coordinate telling you which, which row it's, it's in. And we uh, label the vertices of one of these graphs using a three-part label. One of them tells you, uh, it's called a row label, and it basically tells you the, the y-coordinate of the vertex, so it tells you which row it's in. Uh, another one is the column label, um, which is a label for that vertex in the graph for the particular row that it's in. So each row induces a, a, a subgraph. In fact, it's a subgraph of a path, um, and uh, a, a vertex gets a column label which identifies it uh, in that, that particular graph. Um, and there's a third part, which I'll explain in a, in a moment, but first, if we just look at the, the row and column labels, um, if we take two vertices and compare their row labels, we might find that they're in the same row of this, uh, this picture, in which case uh, we'll be able to use their column labels to test whether or not they're adjacent. We might also look at uh, the row labels of two vertices and find that they're not in the same row and they're not even in adjacent rows in which case we know immediately that those two vertices are, are not adjacent. Uh, and that the tricky part, in fact, the, the whole difficulty uh, is what happens when we look at the row labels of two vertices and we find that one of them is in row 
y, and the other one is in row y plus 1. Um, and this is difficult because the vertex in row y, the top vertex in this picture, let's say, uh, has a label that works for the graph uh, induced by uh, the vertices in row y. Um, the second vertex has a label that works for the graph induced by the vertices in row y plus 1, but those two labels aren't, uh, aren't compatible. Those are two different graphs. Um, those are two different labeling schemes. So that's where the third part of the label comes in, which is a so-called transition label. And it's short, um, and it allows us to, to translate the, the label of the vertex in row y into a label that also works in row y plus 1. Um, and the main idea uh, behind all of this is to use binary search trees. Um, if we use a biased binary search tree for the row labels, we get that um, each vertex can have a row label whose length is log n minus the log of the size of that row. Um, and then we can use column labels. Uh, remember, those, those are identify the subgraph induced by a, a whole row. Um, the subgraph in a row is just a path, so it, can, uh, it gets labels whose length is roughly log the size of that row. When you add those two things together, you get log n in a, in a lower order term. Uh, and the transition labels, they just have to encode the difference between um, the, the path to some vertex x in uh, some tree ty and the path to some vertex x in some tree ty plus 1. So the, 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 the underlying structure is one tree for the rows, a biased binary search tree and a sequence of uh, binary search trees for the uh, one for each, each row, um, along with labels that allow us to, uh, to translate from, from one to the, the next. Uh, and that solves the, the P times P case. And uh, of course, if you look at the video, you'll see some, some details about how that works. There's no time to explain them now. Uh, and in general, for H times P, it's the, the same idea, except that we use the fact that uh, a bounded tree width graph H uh, is actually a subgraph of an interval graph uh, of logarithmic thickness. Um, and then we use uh, so-called interval trees from computational geometry, which have an underlying binary search tree and an assignment of, of intervals to vertices. Uh, and there's also the issue that we only talked about induced subgraphs. Uh, what about uh, real subgraphs, not necessarily induced? Um, in that case, those, that's kind of easy to take care of. You take a, a deorientation of the, the graph, so an orientation where every vertex has out degree d, uh, and then each vertex carries, carries an additional bit vector, which tells you um, if, whether or not each of those edges is truly present or, or not in the, the subgraph. Okay, um, so quick summary. Uh, more precisely, this is the length of the labels in our scheme. So log n, that's a one times log n, that's uh, optimal. The lower order term is maybe not optimal. Um, in terms of, uh, it has obvious consequences now for universal graphs, so a nearly linear number of uh, vertices in a, a universal graph. And there's two open problems here. One of them is the lower order term. The upper bound is square root of log n log log n, and the lower bound is a, a constant. And another open problem is the generality. So I, I listed a bunch of uh, graph classes that uh, these labeling, this labeling scheme works for, uh, but that doesn't include all proper minor closed uh, families of graphs. So we fall a little bit short of, of handling that. Um, it would be nice to, uh, to be able to handle all proper minor closed families of graphs. And thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, we're short on time, so uh, uh, perhaps while the, the next uh, presenter uh, sets up, uh, if there are any questions. Can I have a question? Yes. Sure. Um, so, so the, so the method rely on, um, a structure or characterization of planar graph where you can draw, uh, can write a planar graph as a product, strong product of a path. 
Uh, does, it, uh, does it the same structure how for minor three? For what? For minor three graph, the minor close gra family of graph. Uh, no. Um, so there's, uh, we can get pretty far. We can get to uh, apex minor free uh, families, but not, not all proper minor closed families. Uh, um, just because the, 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 there is no such structure theorem. And, and there can't be, um, and we can't seem to deal with uh, with apex vertices in uh, in the characterizations of those those things. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we'll take uh, other questions uh, uh, offline. Uh, on, uh, can you uh, share your screen? Uh, yes. Right there. I uh, hope you can. Okay, so uh, we're still not in full screen mode. Um, is it good now? That's good. Okay. Um, so can I start? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, next speaker is uh, Hang Wei, and he will talk on light spanners, load tree width embeddings, and uh, efficient traversing in minor free graphs. Um, yes. Um, Tanya Shais. So I'm going to talk about light spanner. Oops, let me go back a bit. Low tree bit embedding and efficient traversing uh, in minor free graph. So this is a joint work with Vincent Cohen Adart from Google Zurich and with Arnold Fusler from Columbia University and with Phil Klein from Brown. So today I'm gonna talk about the capacitated vehicle routing problem where you are given an edge weighted graph and you are given a whole bunch of terminal, K in the subset of vertices and you are given a special vertex, which is uh, highlighted red here, which we call the depot among the setup terminal. And we also given a capacity function, Q is the, for now to think about it as an integer, which is a capacity of the, the vehicle that we are going to talk about. And we want to find a cover of uh, the terminal set. So that the cover, here the cover means the, the union of all the terminal sets is K. Uh, they don't need to be disjoint. Um, and the uh, side of a cover is a mode Q, which is the capacity of the vehicle. And our goal is to minimize the length of the, all the tour, the start from R and visiting all the other vertices. So for example, um, where R is a short tour from R, visiting all the vertices in the cover Ki, in the set in the, uh, in the cover Ki. So for example, here we had a three a cover of three subset and a red and blue and green is a short tour from R visiting all the cover, uh, all the vertices in the same set Ki. And the total length of this collection of two is 14 and we want to file cover so that the total length of all the two are minimized. So what we know about the problem, well, we know that it's a pretty hard problem. So it is AP card for general graph for any capacity, any constant capacity. And when the capacity is one or two, the problem is poly, uh, poly time solvable. Um, even on tree, the problem is non-trivial when Q is part of the input. Where, where we don't have a bow on the capacity. And, you know, for some instance of this problem, where the demand, uh, where, where you had demand and though demand unsplittable, we can, won't get into the detail. There are, with the point here is our generalization of the problem on tree, where the problem are known to be a this car. So in, the, uh, in this work, we look for approximable instances and what, I, what do I mean by that? Well, first we restrict the structure of the graph to be minor free uh, for, uh, for some fixed uh, value of R. Here, here, here there's some, uh, R has nothing to do with the depot. It's just, uh, it's a bad notation. I should put uh, KH or something. But high here is some, some number, it's not the depot. And Q has specific value. So for example, we might look at Q to be a constant. That means for a row, you visit only a constant number of terminals, or we might consider Q to be the capacity, capacity, uh, capacity 
to be infinite, meaning that you can visit all the terminal in one tour. So that's, that become, the problem becomes a subset DSP problem, which is you know, given a set of terminal or fire shortly to visiting all of them. So that are two specific value of Q. Uh, of Q. And, and for, for these two restriction, the restriction on topology of the graph and the, the restriction on the value of Q, we are able to get a prox good approximation algorithm. So here, what it means to be approximable? Yeah, typically a good start is you look for a quasi polynomial time approximation scheme, meaning that you try to look for one plus epsilon approximation in time of quasi polynomial time for any fixed epsilon, something like n to the log n over epsilon, for example. And you know, if you can get a PTAS, meaning polynomial time approximation scheme, this is you know an interesting result. Um, and then sometimes we are able to get an efficient PTAS, meaning that you know the, the running time is some function of epsilon times the polynomial in n. So typically this is the end goal. That is the best, typically this is the best we can hope for. And you might heard of fully polynomial, polynomial time approximation scheme. Typically it's, you know, the, this kind of running time is, is not possible. Uh, so the end goal is gonna be E PTAS, but sometimes you know, we had a long way to get there. So what we get, so what we know for subset DSP. For planar graph, we know that it's, we, we get an efficient PTAS. So that's kind of like an end game. And the same result, we, um, we also had the same result about the genus graph. Uh, but for minor free graph, the best we know, you know from, a, from a paper so that last year is a, a PTAS. It's not an efficient PTAS. So our result, our first result is an efficient PTAS for subset TSP in minor free graph. And the running time is two to the poly of one of epsilon time, some polynomial function of n. So this is kind of like an, uh, an end goal. Uh, for, capacity, uh, for capacitated vehicle routing with constant capacity, what do we know about it? Well, for planar graph, we know a PTAS and, and nothing else. Um, so our result is we first obtain a quasi polynomial time approximation scheme for capacitated vehicle routing problem with constant capacity. So the running time is something like n to the log log n. We almost get polynomial. Um, and we also had an efficient PTAS for capacitated vehicle routing with constant capacity in bounded genus graph. So it's kind of like an end goal. And this also also imply an EP task for planar graph. So what it means is for capacitated vehicle routing problem in bounded genus and graph and planar graph, we really get the best we can hope for, which is an efficient P task. But still, uh, for minor free, it's a Q P task, and we don't know how to get uh, to get a, a P task right now. So that's the uh, for the result. And in terms of the technique, so I would briefly tell you, you know, what kind of technique people use in this area to get a PTAS or an efficient PTAS or QPTAS. There are two techniques, uh, two different techniques to desire PTAS for connectivity problem. The first technique is uh, to get a PTAS from light preserver, what, uh, which I would describe in more detail. And also the second technique is PTAS from low tree width embedding. So let's go briefly through each of them. A PTAS for life preserver, from a life preserver. So what it means to be a life preserver? A life preserver for some optimization problem, say for example, subset TSP, uh, you can define it for many other. Um, so a life preserver, uh, preserver is simply a subgraph that preserves the optimal solution up to one plus epsilon factor. And the weight of the subgraph is a more constant time the weight of the optimal solution where the constant depend on, on epsilon. And our epsilon here is we call the lightness of the preserver. Uh, and there is a, a theorem which first proved by if you climb for planar graph and then it's, it's, play, uh, when, and it's within a standard to minor free graph by the main Hagayagi and Kawarabayashi uh, saying that if you can find a preserver with lightness uh, L epsilon for subset TSP, say, 
then you can get a p-task with running time exponential in the Linux uh, multiplied by a polynomial factor of n. Uh, so for example, last year I constructed a light preserver for subset CLP, but the Linux is have a log n factor that imply you can get a p-task with running time n to the poly one over epsilon. And what we did get in this, uh, in this work is a light preserver with constant Linux for constant epsilon. And then if you plug it in the contraction decomposition theorem, then you will get an EP task with running time to the poly over uh, one over epsilon time the polynomial band. So much time do I have? Okay. So the second technique is a P task from low tree with embedding. So here we consider an, a, an embedding, which could be stochastic, with additive distortion, delta, and tree with k, meaning that you know the distance is blown up by an additive amount delta, and the tree width of the host graph. Uh, is at most k. So if you have second embedding, then we call it is an embedding with additive distortion delta and tree with k. And there is theorem that say if you have additive uh, distort an embedding with additive distortion epsilon diameter times the diameter of g, and the tree width is a function of epsilon and possibly a function of n then we can find one plus epsilon approximation for capacitor vehicle routing with constant capacity in time roughly n to the uh, order of the tree width. So this is a really interesting uh, theorem. And then they sort of use, uh, and then from this theorem, they sort of use a well-known embedding for planar graph, which have a tree width constant and then you plug it in the bow, then you get a p-tag with running time n to the poly one of epsilon. So one of our contribution is to improve the running time from the theorem. So previously you see that the running time is n to the order tree width, we improve it to log n to the, to the order of tree width. And then we're using existing embedding for planar graph, we get um, running time which is log n to the order of the tree width, which is constant. And that would give you an e efficient p-task. And we also show for the first time that for biogenous graph, you can also embed it to the uh, graph with tree with uh, constant and additive distortion epsilon times the diameter. And this also give you a, a efficient p-task. But for minor free graph, the bad embedding we have have tree with log n to the poly, uh, to the time poly one of epsilon. And when you, you plug the bow in the, the in the theorem on the top, then you get a QP task. We're running, uh, we're running time n to the log log n. So what's more? Well, we had a single framework that fit both problem that give you a way to construct live preserver for subtest TSP, and it give you a way to uh, compute a low tree with embedding. Oh, I'm running out of time. So the framework have five steps. Uh, I don't have time to talk about each step. The one interesting about the framework is that it reduce all the uh, it reduce both problem to the problem in planar graph plus one vortex, which is, uh, and with diameter bounded by parameter d. And so the open problem whether we can get QP dust for stoichiometry in minor free graph we don't know. So we now uh, we had a good algorithm for TSV but not stoichiometry. And can we have embedding of minor free graph to constant tree width graph with good additive distortion? We don't know. And a PTA for vehicle routing problem in minor free graph. Currently, we have a QP task. And thank you. Thank you, Han. Um, are there any questions? Um, May I ask a short question? Sure. Yes. Uh, do you think your techniques also work for the Euclidean case if uh, you have capacitive vehicle, vehicle routing in the plane with points in the plane? Uh, yes. So for uh, yes, I think yeah. It's, uh, I think for Euclidean plane, it's already known how to solve capacitive vehicle routing with constant capacity in uh, uh, in polynomial uh, with, with an I think with an EP task, if I remember correctly. 
so for yeah for Euclidean plane, when you have constant capacity, yeah, the problem is already solved. Uh, but when you don't have constant capacity, the best I think is a QPTAS. So it still remains an open problem whether you get a PTAS on Euclidean plane. Does it answer the question? Uh, uh, no, because I thought maybe you can get something better with your techniques, but- uh, Oh, I see. No, yes, no. Yes, yes. But thank you. No, no, yeah. Okay, um, we're running into uh, time for the next talk. So, uh, uh, Anjun, uh, can you uh, share your screen? Uh, uh, sure. Okay, uh, do you see my slide? Yes, we can see it uh, uh, clearly and it's full screen. So the next talk okay. is about uh, uh, twin width, tractable uh, uh, first order model checking. And uh, the talk will be given by, uh, um, by Anjan Kim. So yeah, this is, so this work is a joint work with Edouard Bonnet, Stefan Tomase and Remy Rodriga. It's about, so he, in this paper, we propose a new notion called twin, a uh, new um, graph invariant called twin width. So what is twin width? So it, so it's a, it kind of says that there is a, re, there is um, repeated near twin identification while you keep the error bounded. So what do we mean by identification? Um, so if, so, if you identify two vertices X and Y in the left graph, then this amounts to deleting the two vertices and introducing a new vertex. And we, we, we update the adjacency relation in the following way. So if a vertex was adjacent to both vertices uh, involved in the identification, then we, we make it adjacent to the new vertex. If, we just, if the vertex was non-adjacent with, um, with both vertices in the in the in a both of x and y, then it, it it's non adjacent with a new vertex. And if a vertex was adjacent with one of them but not adjacent with the other, then we uh, record this error by by adding red edge with this vertex and the new vertex. And if some vertex was already um, connected with red edge. With one of with at least one of the two vertices in X and Y, then it keeps having this red edge to the new vertex. So that's how we identify two vertices and update the graph accordingly. So with this um, definition, we you can define the contraction sequence of trigraphs in the following way. So it's a trigraph in the sense that there are three types of relations. One is non-adjacency, the other is adjacency, the other is a red edge, which you know, it's like there was some error accumulated between the two vertices. Uh, between the two vertices. So uh, this decontraction sequence is a sequence of graphs starting from um, the original graph G and ending in, in a single graph G so that at each step you obtain the next graph by um, contracting two non-necessary adjacent vertices from GI and uh, this identification step is defined exactly as we saw previously. And it's called D sequence because the maximum red degree is MOSD for each graph that appears in the sequence. So in this case, this is um, yeah, D contraction sequence. And we say that a graph has twin width and MOSG if, um, if that is the minimum integer D such that there exists D contraction sequence uh, contracting the graph G into a single vertex. So this is an example of a uh, two contraction sequence. Uh, starting from the top left graph, we identify E and F, and that will introduce two red edge because uh, the vertex A was adjacent with F while non adjacent with E. So this error is recorded in this red edge in the same way we uh, introduce red edge. And you can continue this procedure and end in a single vertex graph. 
you can also see that uh, in all the graphs that appears in the sequence, uh, every vertex has red degree at most two. So this is two contraction sequence. So it's a very natural notion. And actually you can, there is a very canonical way of extending this definition for matrices. So how do we define twin width of a matrix M? So we say that this uh, width is M of D if there is a contraction sequence starting from the matrix M to a single entry matrix where all the matrices that appear in the sequence has a red number and most D. So what is, how do we define the contraction for a matrix? So here we contract, instead of, instead of contracting two vertices, we contracted two rows or two columns, which amounts to deleting one of the two rows, um, in case we contract the two rows, uh, deleting one row and replacing the inconsistent entries um, by this entry R uh, for the surviving row. And the red number of a matrix um, is the maximum number of Rs over all rows and columns. So it's not very difficult to see that um, the twin width of a graph G is coincides with the symmetric twin width of the adjacency matrix of G um, in the sense that um, the symmetric twin width requests that whenever you um, identify and uh, contract the two columns, then you immediately follow this step by contracting two corresponding rows or vice versa. Um, so if you make this additional request for the witnessing contraction sequence, then this is, uh, gives you a symmetric twin width, twin width and these two notions coincide. And this also allows you naturally make a natural definition of twin width for a finite binary structure. Uh, and also it turns out to be a crucial toolkit to establish bounded twin width for uh, many graph classes. Also it's useful for establishing other res results that, um, other results. So we propose this notion and what do we do? Um, what do we do with this, um, um, this new notion? So first we prove that a, a generic class of uh, problems called F1 model checking can, can be solved in time linear in the number of vertices. So what is F1 model checking? It consists, uh, the input consists of a graph G, um, and for sort of lo logic sentence phi, and the problem asks whether G satisfies this first order sentence. So in case you're not familiar with a uh, first order sentence, so it's a string of variables, um, existential and universal quantifiers, some logical connectives and binary relation, which um, corresponds to the edge relation and which can be evaluated to true or false on a given graph. So here is one example of F4 sentence, which says that the graph um, has dominating and most, dominating set of size and most K if and only, only if she satisfies this sentence. So um, yeah, FO sentence can um, model many um, graph, proper graph properties like having dominating set of size and most K independent set or um, induced subgraph relations so on and so forth. And for all these graph classes, you can solve um, yeah, the, 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 the model checking can be solved in linear time when you are given with D sequence, D contraction sequence. The second result um, is what we call grid theorem, um, which says the following. So if a matrix has small twin width, which uh, that respects the row and column ordering. So respecting in the sense that you contract two rows or two columns uh, whenever, only when they are neighboring. So you can obtain such um, ordering by permitting the rows and columns um, so if M has such an ordering which uh, witnesses the small twin width, then M doesn't have a large mixed minor. And also the converse holds. Um, yeah, I, I will skip the definition of mixed minor. Oh, so I, do, do I have only five minutes left? Uh, a, bit, a bit less. Uh, oh. The presentation should be 10 minutes, uh, but uh, it's okay if it's a, a bit more. 
Right. Um, I, I think we started a bit later. Okay. Yes. We did. Right. Um, yeah. So the third result, as a third result, we show that a bunch of graph classes have a small tree width, which includes like trees or graphs of bounded tree width, a bounded rank width graphs, unit interval graphs, um, yeah, KT minor free graphs, map graphs, squares, square of planar graphs, so on and so forth. And in order to prove these results, so for the, for, for the like first, um, the white graph classes, they, you can prove that they have small uh, twin width um, from the definition. For the second graph classes, uh, we use grid theorem in a crucial manner. Uh, for the third class, uh, we rely on another result that we proved, uh, which says that if you have an effort transduction, and if you apply the FO transduction for graph class of um, small trim width, then you end up in, in a graph class of small trim width as well. Well, where the twin width depends on the initial trim width and the FO transduction. But, but basically it's saying that our FO transduction doesn't blow up the twin width. Uh, um, so for, I'll not give details of, of FO transduction, but you, you can think of it as a kind of operations that you can apply to a graph or a class of graphs. Um, and these operations can be defined using um, FO logic. So using this FO logic, you can introduce uh, new binary relations and enrich the graphs. Um, so with our results, we generalized many known, um, um, we, we extended known classes on which FO model checking is FPT. Um, let me conclude the talk with um, two open questions. There are many interesting open questions. Some of them were resolved in the past few months. Some of them remain open. So probably the most prominent open question is, um, we still don't know how to compute twin width uh, efficiently even approximately. And like, it would be very interesting to have full characterization of graph classes where FO model checking is FPT. And if such a full characterization is ever obtained, it should, it will, it would um, give kind of unifying perspective uh, of bounded twin with classes and no evidence class because both of, on both of them, FO model checking is FPT. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there uh, any questions? Uh, can you go back one slide? Sure. So, so what's the last slide mean between about the twin width and the polynomial expansion? Oh, so we don't know the, their relation. Okay. okay. So that, that's another interesting open question. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Is the question in the chat? Um, how about the inverse problem to model checking? Given a graph, find the smallest size echo model that is true of the given graph. Smallest size echo model could be upper bound for that for me. Wow. Okay, I haven't thought about this kind of question. Right. Um, I, I don't have any clue. Um, and actually, I haven't thought of this kind of inverse question. Um, maybe. Isn't just a trivial statement always true for every graph? Uh, sorry, say it again. Isn't just the, the trivial statement always true on every graph? Trivial statements always true on every graph. Um, right. Okay, so perhaps there is a, um, a better way to formulate this question and, and try to, to think about uh, a, mini a meaningful question that could have, have a, a more meaningful uh, answer. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I need, yeah, I think like, the, the remaining time is not enough to like, um, yeah, to be convinced of the meaning of the question and have some reasonable answer. Um, okay, thank you again.
let's move on to the to the next uh, talk. Uh, Peter, are you presenting? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. So, visible? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, uh, the next talk is on a independent set uh, on a PK free graphs with in quasi polynomial time, and uh, Peter will give the talk. Yeah, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, yes, so my name is Peter Gartland. This is joint work with Daniel Lovshinov. Uh, we're both at UC Santa Barbara. Um, so before I start, I should mention that if you're interested in seeing a full one hour talk in this paper, there is one available on YouTube. So if you just search Peter Gartland independent set on PK free graphs and quasi polynomial time, it should be the first video that pops up on YouTube. Yeah. Um, so let me just start by setting up the problem. All right. So we're interested in finding a maximum independent set. All right. So in particular, um, what our problem is, is we're given a graph G as input and we want to find a max size independent set in G. All right, there's also a weight aversion, right? So vertices can have weights on them and we wanna find a max weight independent set now. All right, so that's a problem. Um, so independent set, it's a classic MP complete problem, right? It's hard to approximate, no sub exponential time algorithm, no fully polynomial time algorithm. All right, so given these hardness results, uh, we now ask ourselves for which graph class is independent set polynomial time solvable on. All right, so uh, we want to give ourselves a good chance of trying to solve this problem, right? So we're going to restrict our view only to nice graph classes. Um, so in particular, uh, one graph class, right, that the community um, has decided are nice enough to study, right, are graph classes that are defined by a finite set of forbidden induced subgraphs. Right, so really what the general goal is that we have is that we want to um, understand the structure of graphs H such that independent set on H free graphs is polynomial time uh, versus MP complete. All right, so in the hardest direction, uh, we actually know that independent set is hard on most H free graphs. Um, so this is a theorem due to Alexeyev from 1982. All right, so if we let fancy H be a finite set of graphs, um, so that every graph H in fancy H has at least one of the following three properties. Um, it has a vertex of degree four, or it has two vertices of degree greater than or equal to three in the same connected component, or it has a cycle. Um, then independent set will remain MP complete on fancy H free graphs. All right, so um, this reduction is quite easy, but time constraints, I can't really give it here. Yeah, but um, this is actually really quite restrictive then on uh, the remaining cases. All right, so what exactly do these remaining cases look like? Um, well, the remaining cases are gonna be um, where fancy H contains at least one graph H, such that um, every connected component of H is a path or a subdivision of a claw. Right, so our only remaining cases are when this fancy H, right, our set of graphs, contains at least one of uh, a graph that looks like this, right? Contains at least one graph that looks like this, right? We have induced paths, we have subdivided claws. Uh, so a natural question you want to ask is, what is the complexity of uh, PK-free graphs, right? This can be graphs that don't contain any induced path of length K or more. All right, so kind of surprisingly is that even this question is very wide open. We don't know the complexity of PK free graphs. Um, so let me give you some known polynomial time results in this direction. Uh, so Cornel et al. in 1981 gave a polynomial time algorithm for independent set on P4 free graphs. And then there was a long gap uh, until Loshnov et al. in 2014 uh, did this for P5 free graphs. And then that was followed up by Gretzek et al. in 2019, doing this for P6 free graphs. And in between this, we had some uh, quasi-polynomial time results, right? In 2018, quasi-polynomial time algorithm for P6 free graphs. 
And we also had a quasi polynomial time algorithm for P5 graphs in 2013. Um, there are some other results, right? So for claw free graphs, um, a polynomial time algorithm was given by Shibi in uh, 1980. Also, simultaneously, there was one given by Minty, again, also in 1980. Uh, for fork free graphs, that's a claw with just a single edge subdivided one time. Uh, polynomial time algorithm was given by Alexeyev in 2004. And uh, it was extended by Lozen and Milnick in 2008 uh, to handle the weighted version of this problem. And some results beyond polynomial time. Uh, we had that uh, Boxo et al. in 2019 um, gave a sub exponential time algorithm. Uh, for independent set on PK free graphs. And also Chudnovsky et al. in 2019 gave a quasi polynomial time approximation scheme on all remaining uh, classes. All right, so the remaining classes, again, these are H free graphs where H is a force of paths and subdivided clause. All right, so all these results at this point, they're still consistent with independent set actually being NP complete on P7 free graphs. Um, then we have our result. All right, so what our result says is that for every k, independent set on pk free graphs um, has a quasi polynomial time algorithm. And this algorithm also works for the weighted independent set version. It also works for counting independent sets. All uh, right, so this is the first conclusive evidence that independent set is not MP complete on PK for graphs, and of course, is assuming that MP is not contained in quasi polynomial time. All right, um, so yes, our result is only quasi polynomial runtime. Of course, we would have loved to have a polynomial time algorithm, right? Um, but our result is much more general than any polynomial time exact algorithm that has come before it. Right, so um, also uh, this algorithm is quite a bit simpler than the previous polynomial time algorithms, right, for P5 graphs, P6 free graphs, right? So this algorithm really has two strengths. It's, uh, it's very general and it's actually quite a bit simpler than previous polynomial time algorithms. Yes. Um, so what about the remaining cases, right? Uh, so we believe that the previous results that we presented here so far make the following conjecture reasonable. Um, that is, if H is a force of paths and subdivided clause, then independent set on H free graphs is in P. All right, so in other words, uh, we conjecture that all cases whose NP completeness doesn't follow from Alexei's reduction um, has a polynomial time algorithm. Um, and to make proving this a little bit easier, um, there's a theorem that we prove in the same paper that I'm presenting here, right, is that to prove this conjecture that I've just given, I at least have to quasi polynomial runtime, uh, it actually suffices to prove independent set on subdivided claw free graphs is in QP, right, for all subdivisions of the claw. All right, so what this theorem is really saying is that uh, we don't have to worry about force of subdivided claws. We can really just focus on uh, single subdivided clause, right, if we want to prove this conjecture. Yes. Um, so further work that has been done in this direction, uh, Pilchuk et al. Um, gave a simplified version of our algorithm that I'm presenting here today. Um, that algorithm is going to be presented in uh, SOSA 2021. 20, uh, also, we've extended our work Right, so um, we have an extension of this algorithm, right, that works on C sub greater than or equal to K free graphs, um, meaning uh, graphs that don't have an induced cycle of length K or more. Um, and we can also answer much more general problems than just independent set. Um, so uh, like roughly speaking, uh, we can find maximum weight induced subgraphs that belong to sparse classes that are definable by monadic second order logic. Right, and, and that result should be posted on archive soon, um, probably within a week. All right, so for example, some problems that this extension could solve uh, would be like maximum weight induced planar subgraph. Uh, we could solve uh, minimum weight feedback vertex set. Um, this is actually gonna be by complementation. We would solve maximum weight forced by complementation 
we solve minimum weight feedback vertex set. Uh, we could solve something like maximum weight induced triangle packing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of weird little problems that uh, this extended algorithm can actually work on, right? So like, for example, we could solve like minimum weight deletion to not list graphs with uh, say minimum degree three and uh, let's say maximum degree 10, right? Those are just kind of arbitrary numbers that I picked. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of uh, problems that this extension can solve uh, much further beyond independent set. Um, but anyways, uh, the, the approach of both these kind of have a similar flavor. So let me let me give you what the approach is for the PK-free algorithm. I uh, only have a few uh, minutes left. So uh, for our algorithm, right, this is for the PK-free uh, independent set algorithm, our goal is to efficiently break up the graph into small uh, connected components by branching. Right, so how do, how do we do that? Uh, we collect bound separators to guide our branching. And it's really, it shouldn't be surprising actually the balance separators are what we use to guide our branching because balance separators themselves break up the graph into small connected components. Right, so branching is a very classical technique for independent set. Um, now the twist is that we're going to be using balance separators to guide our branching. And that's going to give us an efficient algorithm. Right, so basically what we do is that uh, we branch in our vertex V um, if it has many neighbors and at least a few of the collected balance separators or it has at least a few neighbors and many of the collected balance separators. Then we recurse our connected components. Um, when each component becomes substantially smaller compared to last time, we recurse our connected components. And then we have this base case, right? If the number of vertices of our graph are zero or one, then we just return uh, the number of vertices. Yeah, um, I had a quick slide about runtime, but it seems like I'm basically out of time for my talk, so I should um, open up to any questions. Yes. Thank you, Peter. Um, there is uh, there is a question on the um, on the Zoom chat. Generalizing this uh, reminds me of the dichotomy conjecture theorem for CSP. Might something similar be thinkable for independent set as well? Um, I'm not familiar with the dichotomy conjecture. Um, yeah, so sorry, I, I wouldn't know how to answer this question. Yeah. That's fine. May I say something to this? Uh, uh, we can hardly, I, I can hear someone tr uh, trying to, to ask a question, but uh, you should raise your, your, your voice or your microphone. There might be a question on uh, the chat, looks like. Uh, yeah, so I see the question that's came in chat. Yeah, and unfortunately, I, I, uh, I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, I don't know the, the chat question. Oh, that was that one. I see. Yes, there was another. Uh, Thomas uh, Kochman, were you trying to ask a question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, barely, but uh, we can try to make it. Uh, no, it's the same. I, I, I was posing that question in the chat. Okay. The dichotomy conjecture that was proven several years ago at Fox says that an instance in CSP is either P or NP complete. Mm -hmm. And the, the method was a universal algebra to prove that. And maybe you know, uh, it's also the very simple version is Sheffield's theorem um, for SAT. Do you know this? So it's the same dichotomy. And, and so you say, you were speaking about P, some classes of independent sets are in P and the others are in, um, in P complete. And so that was my, the reason of my question. But for some problems, it's like um, a factorization problem that is intermediate. So, so you need a way to describe it in the relational way of universal algebra. And that was my question. Maybe there's a way to for future research or anything like that. I don't know. So that's my idea. Okay, yeah. So unfortunately, I'm, I'm personally not familiar with those techniques um, oh. or the theorem either. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like quite possibly, I just, uh, it's beyond my knowledge. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this idea. Um, okay, we're moving on to the next uh, uh, talk of this uh, session. Um, let me just find my window. Um, 
So uh, the, talk, the talk is on isomorphism testing for graphs excluding small minors. And uh, Daniel Nguyen, uh, will you give the talk? Okay, Daniel, uh, we, we saw your slides for, for a moment, but we cannot, uh, we didn't hear you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, then somehow my, my earphones seem to intersect with the, with the microphone, that's weird. Okay, then let me share again. Uh, okay. So yes, my name is Daniel Noin, and this is on, on isomorphism okay, please, testing. Please go to uh, full screen. We see the uh, 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 we see the, the Zoom chat. Uh, great. Okay, now it should be correct. Okay, so this is on uh, yeah isomorphism testing for for graphs excluding uh, excluding minors, and it's joint work with Martin Grohe and Daniel Wiking. Okay, so let me just define the problem we are talking about. So this is the graph isomorphism problem where the input consists of two graphs G and H and we want to decide whether they are isomorphic. So whether there is a bijection from the vertex set of the first graph to the vertex set of the second graph that preserves edge relation. And well, the complexity of this problem is a, is, is a long-standing open problem, so naturally it's, it's in NP. But up to this day, we neither know it to be in, in polynomial time, nor it's known to be in NP complete. And well, this, this question already appeared, for example, in, in Carr's paper on NP complete problems and also in the, the Gary and Johnson book. Okay, and well, naturally with the complexity of this problem being open in general, what has happened is that, that people have looked at the complexity for restricted classes of graphs. And in particular, for, for sort of well-known graph parameters, there has been a lot of research in the, in the 80s and 90s, basically providing polynomial time algorithms. So for example, for, for genus, maximum degree, tree width, and so on. And well, the main thing that I want to point out here is that basically the, the exponent for, for all of these running times depends at least linear in age, uh, in, in the parameter. And well, of course, in a way, this is to be expected because at that time, uh, basically, not much better than exponential running times were known for the general graph isomorphism problem. So, as a particular example, uh, it holds that that any improvement on the bounded degree algorithm due to Lux would have also given better algorithms for the general graph isomorphism problem. But of course, then a few years ago, we had this, this big breakthrough result out by Babai, which states that graph isomorphism can be solved in quasi-polynomial time. So now kind of going back to these, these parameterized uh, graph classes, the natural question that we can ask is whether we can basically drop the parameter dependence from, from some, some linear or polynomial function in the parameter to something that is quasi-polynomial in the parameter. And yeah, in, 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 on this research question, well, we have seen several results in the in the last couple of years. So the first one was in a, in a joint work with Martin Grohe and Pascal Schweitzer at Fox 2018, where we could provide a positive answer for maximum degree of the graph. Yeah, so graph isomorphism for n vertex graphs with, with maximum degree d can be solved in, in n to the poly log d. And then, well, basically at the beginning of yes, this year, uh, well, first, I myself could provide another example in this direction. Namely, I could prove such a result for graphs of a bounded Euler genus G. And independently of that, at the same time, one of my co-authors, Daniel Wiebking, could prove such a time bound for graphs of bounded tree width. So n to the polylog in the tree width. Okay, and now, well, the natural thing to do when you have these types of results, polynomial time for bounded tree width and polynomial time for bounded genus, what you can hope for is polynomial time for uh, excluded minors. And this is exactly what we, what we prove in the present paper. 
So graph isomorphism problem for graphs of, of Hardwiger number h or equivalently, equivalently for graphs that exclude the complete graph on h plus one vertices as a minor, we get this, this running time of n to the polylog h for isomorphism testing. Okay, so maybe for completeness, let me just quickly define the Hartwiger number. So we have already seen some talks on, on excluded minors, so I'll be quick about this. So as I said, the Hartwiger number of a graph G is the, is the size of the largest complete graph that can be obtained uh, as a minor, so by deleting vertices and deleting edges or contracting edges. So for the example, for example, we can, uh, we can con contract the green edges and then we obtain the complete graph of five vertices. And indeed for, for this graph, the Peterson graph, this is optimal, so the Hartwiger number is five. And equivalently, we can say that we exclude the, the K6 as, as a minor. Okay, and yeah, I guess it's well known that, that this generalizes both tree width and, and Euler genus up to a constant. Okay, so now coming back to the, to the main theorem, so, so how do we approach this? Well, the main step towards the proof is a decomposition theorem. And well, I guess the, the first thing that I put, should point out here is that, that well, maybe surprisingly, given the, the previous results for graphs of bounded uh, on the tree width and bounded genus, this decomposition result is, is not along the lines of the robertson seymour minor theory, but it's actually in a different flavor, basically trying to investigate the automorphism groups of, of graphs that exclude a minor. So specifically what we get as a decomposition theorem is the following, namely that we can build a tree decomposition. Well, first of all, such that the adhesion width uh, is bounded by H. So the adhesion width is the, the intersection between any two backs of the tree decomposition. And for the single gets, the backs, we get that they're what's what we call TCR bounded. Yeah, for some T that is polynomially bounded in H. Okay. So naturally, this raises two questions. First of all, what is TCR bounded and why is this useful? Okay, let me start with the second question, why this is useful, because this is really simple. And well, the main reason is that isomorphism of TCR bounded graphs can be solved in the desired time. So n to the quasi polynomial in, in T. And actually this is something that I proved in the, in the same paper as the, the isomorphism test for bounded genus graphs. Yeah, so actually, this is also how you obtain the, the end of the polylog G algorithm for bounded genus G by showing that, that bounded genus graphs are indeed TCR bounded. Yeah, so in this way, kind of the decomposition theorem that we see here again connects to the, the robertson seymour minor theory. Okay, so now given this, let me, let me explain to you what TCR bounded graphs are. And well, here, the, the starting point is basically a standard algorithm for, for approaching the graph isomorphism problem, which is the, the color refinement algorithm, where sort of the, the basic idea is that we want to try to color vertices of the graph by, by inspecting their, their size of the neighborhoods and, and more precisely the, the color patterns of vertices that appear in the neighborhood uh, to, in order to, to distinguish them from other vertices so that we can say that vertices of different colors cannot be mapped to each other by an isomorphism. Okay, and for, for t-color refinement, the basic idea is to extend this definition that we can now also sort of split up color classes that are small, that have size at most t. Okay, so let me give an example for this. Say we have this graph here and, and we want to investigate this for, for two-color refinement. Okay, so then we can first run the color refinement algorithm. That is in the first step, we classify vertices by their degree. Now, so black vertices uh, have degree one, red vertices have degree three, and white vertices have degree uh, four. And now we can again refine using, uh, yeah, using neighborhood types. So for example, the leftmost and the rightmost white vertex have both one red neighbors, but the other white vertices don't. So we can refine and well, we can iteratively go on like this. And, until the graph looks like that. Okay, and now we see, for example, that the, that the two red vertices in the bottom, this forms now a color class of size two. So now we can use the two split to also split these color classes up. And we can do the same for the other color classes of size two. 
Okay, now again, the, the coloring is not stable with respect to refinement. So we can again apply refinement. Um, this will create more color class of size two and we can again split them up. Okay, and now the, the crucial property is that we say a vertex is infected if it has a unique color, i.e. a color that doesn't appear anywhere else. And we show this by, by, this, by these red dots here. Okay, and the graph is TCR bounded if the entire vertex set gets affected, applying the TCR algorithm. And, well, just to give you a bit of an intuition why this is useful, the basic idea is, well, okay, color refinement, the standard algorithm obviously helps us in, in yeah, deciding that certain vertices cannot be mapped to each other by, by isomorphisms. And the T-split is okay, essentially, because when the color classes are small, we only have few possibilities. And these things can be handled by, by group theoretic techniques that, that uh, yeah, have been developed or exploited since the 80s for the graph isomorphism problem. Okay, so back with this, let me get back to the decomposition theorem. So this is what we get. And um, yes, so, so here I won't dive into the proof for time reasons. If you want to more, know more details about that, I can either refer you to the paper or to the full video. And instead, let me just quickly explain how we can get the main result based on the decomposition theorem. So that's basically by, by standard techniques now. So if we are given two graphs G and H, we first apply the, the main decomposition theorem, which gets us the, the tree decompositions. And then what we can do is just use standard dynamic programming techniques in a, in a bottom-up fashion to compute isomorphisms. And we basically, for the, for the single bags, we can do this using the isomorphism test for TCR bounded graphs from my iCal paper. And then for the, for the dynamic programming along the tree decomposition, we can adapt the techniques developed by my co-author, Daniel Wiebking, for his algorithms for bounded tree width graphs. Okay, so to conclude, let me, let me just show you these open questions. And well, for this slide, what I mainly want to mention is that by now we can actually have uh, a positive answer for the first question. So in the last couple of weeks, I was able to generalize the results of this paper to graphs that not only uh, yeah, have an excluded minor, but actually only have an excluded topological minor, which then also captures graph classes of bounded degree. And we get the same yeah, quasi-polynomial runtime in this case. And I think I'll stop here and take your questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Any questions? Do, do you see any way to uh, any particular parameter for which you can uh, maybe bring down the, the, the running time uh, down from quasi polynomial to polynomial? What, yeah, I mean, I don't really understand the question. I mean, the the the, if the, the parameter is, is fixed here, then it is polynomial. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, most for, for most parameters, this will be more general than graph isomorphism in general, I, I guess so. Okay, that was a stupid question. <laughs> Any other questions? What's your intuition about the second question? Do you think, it, are, would you bet more like to the yes side or no side? I really don't know. This seems to be a very difficult question, which is, which is open for a long time. And yeah, the, I mean, the, I guess the point here is that the only techniques that we know for, for maximum degree are based on group theory. And, and this doesn't seem to help for, for designing FPT algorithms, so. So that's really unclear, and I think new ed new ideas are required to to answer this question. Oh, would you would you ask the similar types of questions for other parameters that you have considered so far, or is there like obvious reason which where the answer is obviously no? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, you can you can consider the same questions for for all the other standard parameters. So what is known so far are FPT algorithms for for tree width and genus. And I guess one particular question is whether we can have FPT for, for excluded minors. And I expect this to be the case, but 
but probably at that point one one would have to fall back on the robertson sema minor theory again thank you Are there any other questions not on slack okay in that case uh, i would like to thank all the speakers of the session and uh, uh, the next session resumes tomorrow.